Okay, we have a few more people coming in. Okay, welcome to Heartfelt Care, Managing Caregiver Anger in the Dementia Journey. My name's Sally Smith, and I'm helping facilitate today's webinar. Closed captioning is enabled, so if you'd like to, click or tap closed caption to start the closed captioning. If you Yay. would, please, you can hold your questions you. to the end, um, or you can type them into the chat, and I will make note of them. Please advance the slide. I'm pleased to welcome you today and introduce you to your presenter, Tammy Anastasia. Tammy is a dementia consultant, educator, and speaker. She's also the author of the acclaimed book, Essential Strategies for the Dementia Caregiver, Learning to Pace Yourself. Tammy holds a Master of Arts in Counseling, a Certificate in Gerontology, and a Certificate in End of Life. She's also a Certified Senior Advisor. For more than 30 years, Tammy has provided counseling services, dementia guidance, emotional support, and care strategies to family and professional dementia caregivers. She also facilitates twice-monthly support groups. Please join me in welcoming Tammy. Hello, Sally. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, again, we're going to focus on the caregiver, managing caregiver anger uh, throughout the dementia journey. So I'm not going to be focusing on the person living with dementia, but mainly focusing on the caregiver for today's presentation. I am going to begin the presentation by going over how dementia impacts the caregiver. First of all, dementia impacts the caregiver. It presents with a lot of communication challenges as dementia progresses. It becomes exceptionally difficult to try to have a reasonable, logical conversation with your loved one when they lose that ability as their brain becomes more and more impaired. So communication challenges becomes a lot more difficult to deal with. Also, it's very emotional. Taking care of a loved one with dementia is very much an emotional journey because of the cognitive and behavioral changes that occur. And in many ways, uh, you can start feeling quite alone as their ability declines and their ability again to communicate and connect with you. Also guilt. Many people get very, very stuck in making difficult decisions because of the guilt that they carry. They don't want to go against their loved one's wishes or they don't want to bring in care, for example, because they don't want to upset their loved one. And yet it's probably the very thing that we have to do in order to provide the best care for them. Also, and I'll talk more about guilt as we go along. Also, as the family caregiver or primary caregiver care partner, you become the decision maker. And one of the hardest things about this journey is you're forced to make some very, very, very difficult decisions on your loved one's behalf. And it's very hard to do that when you don't have your loved one to be able to bounce off of and discuss what what you need to do that's in their best interest. And because of the impairment in the brain, they often don't understand and can't process why you're making some of the decisions you're making. Also, there is what we call role transition. Your relationship and your role in the relationship changes, and that can be an adjustment as well. And then we also deal with loss, sadness, and grief. You experience the loss of the person they once were and the relationship that you had with this person pre-dementia and then any future plans that you were looking forward to pre-dementia as well. Dementia also impacts family dynamics. Other family members aren't available to help. They might be unsupportive or they may dismiss your concerns and frustrations. Often what will happen is any underlying family dynamics tend to come to the surface when we are caring for a loved one with dementia. And then loneliness, family and friends disappear or don't stay in touch. I hear this a lot in my private practice. 
And it becomes a very lonely feeling as family and friends disappear, mainly because they don't know how to interact with the loved one living with dementia. And your life is so consumed with caring for your loved one that it can feel incredibly lonely. And then your health becomes at risk. Uh, caregiving for a person living with dementia really can take a toll on your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. And we're going to talk about maybe some things that you can do to help maintain your own self-care. And then lack of control. This is one thing that's so incredibly sad about dealing with and caring for a loved one with dementia is that we can't stop the progression. We can slow it down, but we all know where this is going to end and how it's going to end at some point. And then also the financial burden, the weight of the world financially, how are we going to pay for their cost how of care? How are we, how are we going to manage our finances so that you can care for them all the way till end of life and not go broke and have money for yourself to support yourself after this journey is over. And then unpredictability. I talk a lot to my private clients about how to deal with the unknown, like how long is this going to last? Is it going to be five years, 10 years, three months, six months? That too is the unknown. So what I'd like to do right now real quick is have you take a poll and tell us what uh, which of the dementia uh, impacts you the most that you find most challenging. So Sally will put up a poll and we'd like to just kind of get a sense as to what is the most challenging impact for you. The poll should have popped up. Can somebody give me a thumbs up and let me know that you can see it? The poll Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, it's nice to see what... Uh... And Sally, you'll read the results of the poll. Absolutely. Yeah, we still have folks answering. So Great. we'll just give give it a couple more minutes. Yeah. Okay, it looks like most, whoops, a couple more coming in. Okay. So you should be able to see the results. We had 31% um, say family dynamics, 26% communicating with your loved one, 18% not knowing how long this will last. 14% uh, you're changing role, 8% being the sole decision maker, and 3% the financial burden. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for doing that poll. Uh, it just gives me a sense as to what are the most uh, challenging situations. So because of how dementia impacts the caregiver, it is very normal and common for you to feel and to get angry. We're many, 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 many reasons why we may get angry. Get angry at the, at the dementia, get angry that your life has been turned upside down, get angry that how much the dementia has changed your loved one. So this is normal, it's to be expected. It's just part of the journey. It's also normal to feel numb. This is the way we emotionally take a little time out. This is a, a way we take a little bit of a break. We have to distance ourselves from the intensity of the emotions and the frustrations. And so this is the emotional defense mechanism kicking in and we get numb. It is also normal to feel guilty, which I'm going to talk more about later in this presentation and hopefully reduce the amount of guilt you feel for, for, for getting angry. And it's also normal to feel frustrated it is frustrating. Our loved one has changed. This is new. We don't have a perfect roadmap. We can't figure it all out all at once. And it can be incredibly frustrating. And then also feeling impatient. You know, you've got a million things going on. You just want your loved one to cooperate. They're not cooperating. And we're trying to get them out of the house and they're very slow and they've got to do their ritual and do their thing. And we can feel very impatient. 
and also wanting this journey to be over. It's very, very common. I hear that a lot in my private practice. That does not mean you, you are wishing your loved one ill will. Wanting this journey to be over means that you love them so much that you want this journey and this suffering and their quality of life to move on so that their quality of life and the suffering uh, comes to an end. So these feelings are very valid and they're normal. One of the best ways to deal with these feelings is to modify our expectations, which I'll talk about also later as we go along. Then one of the things that's super important about dealing with our own anger is recognizing what triggers us to get angry and then the different ways anger is expressed. So again, I want to reiterate that anger is a natural emotional response to the stress and the responsibilities of caregiving and when we're trying to manage the cognitive and behavioral changes that dementia causes. So what are some of the most common triggers that cause us to get angry? One is repeated questioning and forgetfulness. This happens when our loved one has short-term memory loss. They will repeat questions over and over and they will be incredibly forgetful. And what you wanna know about this is, is this is something you have no control over and it is a result of short-term memory loss. Another common trigger is the disruption of your own personal routine and lack of personal time. There is a thing called shadowing. And sometimes your loved one will be joined at the hip with you and you don't get one second to yourself. This can be in, come incredibly frustrating to deal with. And here again, this occurs because you are your loved one's security blanket, but this is a common trigger. Also feeling unappreciated and unsupported, not only by your loved one that you're taking care of, but also by other family members and friends. This can trigger anger as well. And then pre-existing feelings about your loved one will trigger anger also. I have many clients who are taking care of a loved one who may not have been very nice or neglectful, neglectful of them when they were growing up and now they're taking care of a parent with dementia. Or we have parents or a spouse who is very manipulative and then we react as though they're doing something intentionally the way they did pre-dementia when in reality now they have dementia and they are acting like a person with dementia, but we have these pre-existing feelings that carry over, which can cause us to get angry as well. And then the physical and emotional exhaustion is going to keep us on a very short fuse. The more tired we are, um, the more our fuse is going to be short, which is why it's so critically important to do the best you can to take care of yourself physically and emotionally. And I'll talk more about that as we go along as well. And then um, we will also, our, our anger button can get triggered when they're uncooperative or resistant to care. And here again, I wanna shed a little bit of light on why they may be uncooperative or resistant to care. As their brain gets impaired, they may be uncooperative because they don't know what you're asking of them. They may not remember how to do it. They may not even understand what you're asking them to do. And they're resistant to care because their brain is impaired and they may be perceiving you to do things that they feel might be threatening and therefore they're resistant to care. Just to, I just want to provide a little light on why their behaviors may be the way they are because this is going to cause you to react. This is going to cause you to get angry. And sometimes when we understand their behaviors and why it's happening will allow us to step back. So I just wanted to shed a little bit of light on why these things may trigger anger and to give you some insight as to why the behaviors do happen. And then unrealistic expectations, one of the most common triggers for anger. We expect them to be, behave a certain way. We expect ourselves to be, behave a certain way. And then when we don't do that, we get very angry or we get angry at them because they, again, aren't cooperating. So it's really, really good to know what your triggers are 
Because when you know what your triggers are, we can plan for them. We can prepare in advance how to respond when these things happen. Because when we're caring for a loved one with dementia, they don't have control over the things they say and do. So we want to prepare in advance for when these things happen, how to respond and react. And then how is caregiver anger expressed? Many, 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 many different ways. And verbally, you may, may express it by arguing. You may express it by yelling. You may non-verbally bang things around, slam doors, and then also internally feelings of resentment. These are all things that I hear constantly in my private practice. And I just want to normalize that what you're going through, these are normal feelings, normal reactions. And our goal is to figure out ways now how to diffuse it and how to decrease the frequency of getting angry. So one of the best things to do is to think about how can we manage anger in the moment? Anger happens. It happens in a split second. And so what are some ways to manage anger in the moment? Take a few deep breaths, count to 10, apologize. This is one of the easiest and one of the most effective ways to diffuse a situation that you may be very frustrated and or your loved one may react angrily. So apologize. I'm so sorry I upset you. We can own it. I'm so sorry that I misplaced that item. Owning it and apologizing to yourself is one of the best ways to diffuse anger in the moment. And then I, I like to recite a dementia uh, mantra. You know, dementia is responsible for uh, the way my loved one is behaving. Dementia is responsible for the way my loved one is behaving. Dementia is causing my loved one to say and do these things. Or maybe recite a prayer or a quote. One of my favorites is the serenity prayer. And um, it just allows me to get centered for that moment that I just react and I try to get myself centered. And then have some emotional outlets. Think about different ways you can emote how you're feeling about the anger. Maybe it's journaling, maybe it's calling a friend. And then some physical outlets, go for a walk. Now, when we leave the room, we excuse ourselves and we walk away, we wanna make sure that your loved one is, in a, is safe and that you're also safe. So physical outlets, I do have clients who scream in a pillow. I have some that actually blow bubbles and they pop the bubble when they blow it with their, with their finger, just as a way of dealing with their anger in the moment. And then forgive yourself. I mean, listen, anger is anger. It's an emotion we all have. And the sooner we can forgive ourselves, the less we'll hang on to the anger and the less the anger is going to have that physical effect and emotional effect on us. And then think about ways to maybe distract yourself just to kind of pull yourself out of the moment of the intensity of what happened. And is it flipping through a magazine? Is it listening, putting on music? And then one of the things that I really encourage my clients to do too is reflect on what happened. What, what happened, look at it objectively. I don't want you to be critical of yourself. I don't want you to be judgmental. I want you to step back and say, what happened? Why did I react the way I did? And be very open-minded about it. Have a better understanding as to what happened so that now, again, we can plan for if it happens again in the future, because it probably will, what can we do to pre-plan for what may be a trigger for you? And then also acknowledge what pushed your buttons. Um, it, it, I got my buttons pushed because I didn't like my, my wife asking me a million times, where am I going? Where am I going? Or she accused me of having an affair. What are the things that are going to push your buttons so we can prepare responses for what the person living with dementia doesn't have control over saying and doing? And then always redirect by changing the topic or situation if that's possible. And a lot of times in order to redirect, we have to validate what we hear them saying and then bring up a topic or a story or a joke they've told you a million times that you know they enjoy as a way of, again, diffusing the anger in the moment. 
So what I'd like to kind of hear from you is what is one anger management strategy you could commit to in putting into practice going forward now? And go ahead and write those in the uh, chat. Michelle says breathing. Yeah. Ava says mantra. Okay, great. Carol says recite mantra. Phyllis says walking. Carly says forgive yourself. Um, Michelle says I also walk away and do food prep. Harriet says leave the room. Jocelyn says take a few deep breaths. Christine says forgive yourself. Great. Uh, Linda says playing with my golden retrievers. Linda yeah. says, uh, another Linda says, work in my garden. Jeff says, singing. Terry says, walking away for a few minutes. And Tanya says, apologize and give space. Great. Okay, great, great, great. I think the main gist of what I'm going to be sharing today is I really don't want you to beat yourself up, punish yourself, and do a number on yourself because you got angry. Angry is an emotion. It is a feeling that we are going to have. And again, the more we understand what pushes our buttons, the more we can prepare in advance. And then when our buttons get pushed, what can we do to diffuse the intensity of that anger? So thank you everybody for sharing that. Next, I wanna talk about the battle between anger and guilt. Unfortunately, and often, when we get angry, we feel incredibly guilty. So I wanna talk about guilt and put guilt in perspective if possible. So first and foremost, understand why you feel guilty about feeling angry. Some of the reasons we feel guilty are family messages, society, and our own personal expectations. Or we feel anger is an unacceptable emotion, or do you see anger as a sign of failure? So. Guilt doesn't and should not, to the best of our ability, not have a place in this demented journey when we are dealing so much with trying to provide the best care for our loved one. Guilt implies you're doing something wrong. There is nothing wrong that you're doing. We're reacting to a situation that's frustrating. We're reacting to a situation that makes us angry. Um, so one of the best ways is to convert your shoulds, S-H-O-U-L-D-S, -S, and replace the word should, and instead say, replace it with what I can do, what I will do, and what I want to do. Shoulds are often unrealistic expectations that we're placing on ourselves, and therefore, we're going to set ourselves up to be disappointed and frustrated with ourselves. When in reality, when we convert those shoulds to what I can do, will do, and want to do, now those are realistic expectations. Those are things that you can do, you're willing to do, and you want to do. So be very, very careful and start redefining what guilt and the guilt that you're placing on yourself. I grew up Catholic. I am the oldest of five, and I spend a lot of time working through the guilt that I often feel sometimes because, again, of messaging that I got. And I started challenging, you know, the guilt that I feel for situations many, many, many times is so unwarranted for what happened. And I'm constantly talking about redefining, reevaluating the guilt that I carry or that I own when I get upset with myself. So I also need to recognize what my guilt triggers are. We talked about the anger triggers. Now let's look at what triggers you to feel guilty. Um, identify, think about, identify specific situations or thoughts that trigger guilt. What specifically makes you feel guilty? I'll use myself as an example. Being the oldest of five, I was told I was responsible for my siblings. So I took that even further. So now if somebody treats me a certain way or says something to me, I immediately think, oh, I'm guilty. What did I say or do to get them upset? And I have to work through that guilt and talk myself through it and look at it more realistically. So what is the messaging that fuels the guilt? And now let's come up with counter proposals, other ways of thinking about that guilt 
so that you can forgive yourself and know that every decision you're making, every choice you're making is with the best of intentions and it doesn't warrant the guilt that we inflict on ourselves. Also differentiate again between realistic caregiving responsibilities and self-imposed expectations. Self-exposed, uh, self-imposed expectations is again, those standards, those expectations we feel we have to live up to. And often there it's messaging we got when we were children and society places a lot of pressure on us to be a certain way as well. So, but we have control over the things we think and what we say to ourselves. And you have a right to change how you feel about guilt so that you give yourself more credit for what you do rather than punish yourself and feel guilty for the things that you're trying to do the best at. And then expecting yourself to be perfect. That's something also that I have to work on constantly. But I spend a lot of time working this through so that I can forgive myself and understand more about myself and what the triggers are and find a way to forgive. And then change how you think about anger and guilt. Same thing that I've been saying. Caregiving is a role that includes anger and a range of emotions. Our emotions fluctuate from one hour, one day, one second, one minute. They fluctuate. And the dementia journey is a journey of fluctuating emotions. And anger happens to be one of them. And then accept anger as part of the caregiving experience. I'm not here to tell you not to feel angry. I'm here to validate anger as part of this journey and also find ways to diffuse it and find ways to decrease the frequency of it. But you're human and anger is going to be part of this journey. And then getting angry doesn't mean you're a bad or an unloving person. Getting angry means something set me off, something upset me. Let me look at what that is. And what is anger trying to tell me? What is it that I need to be aware of? What can I do to be prepared in advance? So I really want to encourage you not to use uh, guilt as a way of making you feel so bad about yourself, because the truth is you're really doing the best you can under all of these different circumstances. There's so many cognitive behavioral changes, so many emotions that we're dealing with. So try to change how you define and think about guilt. In addition, you also wanna change your self-perception, how you perceive yourself. One of the things that makes me so sad in my work is I work with so many lovely, amazing, and incredibly pe incredible people. And it makes me so sad that they feel so judgmental and critical of the decisions they make or what they say and what they do. And the truth be told is you have to believe in yourself more than anybody else on this planet and give yourself the credit that you deserve. So one of the best things to do is instead of being judgmental and upset and getting angry at yourself for getting angry, ask yourself what caused you to react. There's a reason you reacted. Educate yourself, learn more about yourself, learn more about dementia, anticipate and prepare. And what can you say or do differently next time? Don't please try not to judge and criticize and beat yourself up. It happened, forgive. And now what can we learn from the circumstances? Change your perception and by practicing forgiveness, forgive yourself for moments of anger. Be com as compassionate and kind to yourself as you would be with anybody else in your shoes. Give back to yourself the love and the compassion and the care that you are providing for your loved one. And also reframe your inner dialogue. Reframe your inner dialogue. Two things I want you to think about. One is reframe what you're telling yourself about your loved one's behavior. I'll often hear my clients will say, you know, um, my loved one just doesn't want to do A, B, and C, or my loved one refuses to do A, B, and C, and I know they're capable of doing it. What you say to yourself about their behavior is that we have to be more realistic about what to expect from a person with dementia. 
because what we think they're capable of doing, they may not be capable of doing because of damage being done to the brain. So I'm always running interference and saying, please reframe how you say that. My loved one's not capable of taking a shower because she forgot how to do it. My loved one doesn't know how to set the table because he forgot how to set the table. In other words, really educate yourself about dementia and the behavior changes and the cognitive changes that occur. In addition, reframe what you say to yourself. Reframe what you say to yourself. Because for every negative, there is a positive. Spend more time on reframing the negative into a positive. For example, you might say, um, you know, I'm so impatient. No, I'm not impatient. Patience is a learned skill and I'm learning as I go along. Reframe what you say to yourself because if we reframe what we say to ourselves, our thoughts control how we feel. How we feel affects how we react. And so really think about reframing what you say about your loved one's behavior be really understanding of the things they can't do, there's probably a reason for it. They're not intentionally doing things to upset you. They're not intentionally saying things to upset you. It's truly the damage that's being done to their brain. And likewise, you're doing the very best you can. So try to reframe what you say to yourself, because that too will be a gift that you'll give back to yourself. And then build resilience. I can honestly say this journey changes you profoundly in so many ways, and you build up so much resilience. You, you're so much more capable of doing things that you probably could never fathom if you weren't on this journey. So see challenging experiences as opportunities for learning. You know, I, I have a saying that I say to myself, some of the most painful situations are the things that I learn from the most. And sometimes I think, gosh, is there another way to learn these things without having to go through the pain of doing it? And unfortunately, sometimes the best learning is by looking at the challenges and as opportunities to learn from, again, versus doing a number on yourself and beating yourself up for getting angry. And allow anger to be a platform. I allow anger and guilt to be a platform for me to learn more about the circumstances myself, to increase my self-awareness, as well as an opportunity for personal growth. And this journey is a journey that is going to provide you with all of those opportunities. Find meaning and purpose in your role as a caregiver. I always say to my private clients, the people in my support groups, and anytime I do a speaking event, you truly are a gift to the people you're taking care of. Please be as compassionate, kind, and supportive of yourself as you are to the person you're caring for and to those people you love as well. And then modify your expectations. I have to honestly say that is a constant tweaking because in the dementia journey, your loved one loses their ability to do things slowly over time. And as this journey progresses, they lose the ability to function in a world that they no longer possibly recognize. And they've lost the abilities to take care of themselves in the way that we may expect them to be able to do, but because of the damage done to the brain, they lose that ability. So educate yourself as much as possible about dementia and how it changes so that you have a better understanding as to why they behave the way they do and educate yourself about yourself. Use this journey as an opportunity to learn more about yourself and to honor your feelings and what can we do with these feelings? What are they telling you? How can they be of help rather than a hinder? And then accept what is. This is probably the most difficult and the most challenging part of the dementia journey is letting go of what was, who my loved one was, the relationship we had, and now truly embrace my loved one as the person with dementia. And how now do I connect? How now do I enter their world as it gets altered? And how do I take care of myself 
along this journey as I am trying to take care of my loved one. And again, convert those shoulds into what you can, will, and want to do. And surround yourself with people and friends who are supportive. Family and friends, not everybody's going to be supportive in the way we need. Try not to exhaust your energy, trying to convince people what it is you need to, them to understand or to see. Believe in yourself. Understand that you are the very best person. You know better than anybody else what you're going through. And you surround yourself with people who are supportive and loving, who will help hear what you have to say will act on any help you may need. And for those people who don't understand, then we share the details, what they get or they don't get, we have to let go of, and you continue supporting and finding people who will be supportive of you. Surround yourself with people who are supportive. And one of the best ways to do that is to join support groups and get perspective on what you're going through this is a new journey. This is an intense journey and it fluctuates day by day. Behaviors are changing. And I always kid around with my, my clients and in, in the support groups, right when we think we have a strategy figured out, oh my gosh, well, you know what? It worked for that moment in time. And now I've got to think about another strategy. So one of the best ways to gain perspective and the validation is in support groups. And if you have to reach out to a consultant like myself or counseling, please give yourself permission to do that. So next, what I'd like to do is, again, one of the best ways to deal with anger is by engaging in self-care. Because the better we take care of ourselves, the less frequent, we will react and get angry and the more forgiving we will be of ourselves. So what can we do to engage in self-care? Acknowledge your triggers. Just simply know what your triggers are. If you don't know what they are, let's look and find out and anticipate and prepare responses in advance. Knowing full well, your buttons may get pushed. This is what I can say. This is what I can do. If you get angry, forgive, learn, understand what happened. What do I need to do differently? What is it that I have to grow from? Take daily breaks to rejuvenate and recharge. I know it's so hard when we're so consumed with caregiving that it's hard to take a break. So I'm going to encourage each and every one of you to take at least a one 10 minute break and do something kind and nurturing because your body and your mind need the opportunity to have some downtime and to recharge. Set boundaries. Set boundaries. Surround yourself again with people who are going to be supportive. And you can say no to things if you don't think they feel right. If they're going to deplete your energy, please protect yourself and set boundaries. And practice detaching. I know this is easier said than done. Do the very, very best you can to try not to take personally what your loved one says and does. Because the less we take personally, the, the, the less we're going to be reactive. It's really difficult, but they don't have control over the things they say and do. So if you have to start repeating that mantra, dementia is causing my loved one to behave this way. Dementia is causing my loved one to behave this way. Their brain is impaired. Their brain is distorted. Their thinking is irrational. This is all about dementia. And then you detach to the best of your ability. And we respond to dementia behaviors versus taking it personally. And then practice being flexible and adaptable. And I kind of think that is something we learn throughout this journey, whether we like it or not. And then let go of what you cannot control. We can't control dementia. We can't control what dementia is doing to your loved one's brain. But what we can control is how you feel, what you think, what you say to yourself, how you react, how you respond, and again, forgive. And then do the best you can to stay connected socially. Very hard to do when you're so consumed with so many demands and responsibilities and challenges. But do the best you can to stay socially connected. You know, maybe just have somebody call once a night 
and just check in. I'm just checking in on you. I'm thinking about you. Just wanted to hear your voice. Thank you for saying hello. Two, three minutes because it can get really exhausting if your whole world now just becomes about dementia. I know a lot of new mothers will say, oh my gosh, I need adult conversation. You know, I've been talking to my infant, my baby, and all I do is talk to talking to children. Well, with dementia, we're going to need to talk outside of dementia sometimes. So you have a connection to the outside world. And then again, join a support group, respite care. Respite care can come in many forms. Respite care could be having a friend coming over and they entertain your loved one and you get to go out for three or four hours. It could be placing them into a care community or it could be uh, having them go into a day program. All of these things give you a break. And when we talk about support, think about what your needs are. Think about what is it that you need. Ask people and tell them specifically, you know, I, it would really be helpful if you could come and spend an hour and a half with my husband while I go to the grocery store. It would be really nice if you're going to the store, could you pick me up three cans of tuna? Be as specific as possible about what your needs are because we want to help, but sometimes we don't know what it is you need. Please feel free to articulate specifically what it is you need and then hire part-time or full-time assistance. And then if if needed, we will have to move our loved one into a care community. And what I wanna say about moving a loved one into a care community, it's gut-wrenching. It's a very, very, very difficult, very difficult decision. And it's a transition for both you and your loved one. But what I do wanna say about that is, love doesn't end when we place them in a care community. We're extending the love so that they get their needs met to the best of, the, of people's ability. You're surrounding them with more resources and more people who can help take care and support the needs as their needs increase as dementia progresses. So I know a lot of people feel they're, they're abandoning their loved one and there's enormous guilt about that. And I just want to support that moving a loved one is an extension of the care and the compassion that you're providing for your loved one. So in summary, I, oh, before we move on, what is one self-care uh, action that you can commit to doing on a regular basis? Would Please you type it into the chat. Yeah. Swimming at 7 a.m., says Tammy. Diana says take breaks. Right. Jennifer says exercise. CM right. says take breaks. Samantha, meditating. Uh, Beth, let go of what I can't control. Tammy, yoga. Uh, Michelle, I've hired full-time assistants. Right. Nancy, pat my dogs. Phyllis, keeping my own social support group alive. Liz, just walking. Janet, watch mindless TV. More walking, uh, see friends, dance to any and all music. Great. And Beth says walking and Jill says early morning walks. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. Terry says sing. Great, great. Acknowledging triggers. Cheer great. on our amazing care team. Great. And now we also have a whole nother list that we could add as uh, things progress. So in summary, um, Please forgive yourself. You will get angry. Understand what the anger is about and forgive. F stands for feel your feelings. What is causing you to feel angry? And what can you do differently? And O is for ongoing support. The more support, the better. And support can come in many different forms. Um, I have sometimes when I feel really down and out, I have some friends that I call who are just hilarious. They have no idea. I'm feeling down and out and I'll just give them a call because they'll snap me out of my mood because they're so hilarious. There's other people that I call when I really need to talk about something that might be upsetting or something that's really personal that I need to process. Again, R, reframe your inner dialogue. What you say to yourself about yourself is so incredibly important. 
uh, Nathaniel Brandon had a quote of all the judgments we pass, none are more important than the judgments we have of ourselves. And then also reframe your loved one's behavior and really understand it from a dementia perspective that what they are doing is a result of what's happening to their brain. And please give back to yourself the love, the kindness, the compassion that you express to others. Identify your triggers. That is key in helping us understand more about ourselves and also to bring more inner peace within ourselves. And please do voice your needs. What are your needs? And you're going to know that by what you can do, will do, and want to do. A lot of your needs are going to be those shoulds. And so please feel free. Please, I encourage you to call on people to ask for help and let us support you in the very best way we can. And then again, engage in self-care. So thank you, everybody. Before I end this presentation, I would like for us to do one thing all together. And that is on three. I'd love for us to read out loud uh, the quote by Nancy L. Kreisman. So on three, would you please read it out loud with me? One, two, and three. My caregiver, My mantra, caregiver mantra is to remember, is to remember the only yeah, control, you, control have you have is over the changes you choose, you choose, choose, to, make. You choose to make. Thank you everybody for the love, the care, and the support you do provide day in and day out. Please forgive, allow yourself to learn, and you will survive this journey. So before I take any questions, I am going to take, turn this over to Sally, and then we'll be happy to do questions here right after Sally goes through her thing. Terrific. Thank you so much, Tammy. Uh, before you wrap up, I want to spotlight Tammy's services. She offers one-on-one -on -one caregiver counseling and coaching to support you in your caregiving journey. So whether you need guidance on caregiver strategies or emotional support, uh, Tammy's expertise is invaluable. You can reach out to her for personalized support and guidance to navigate the challenges of caregiving. And I'm going to drop into the chat um, a link where you can book your one-on-one -on -one appointment with Tammy. Um, advance the slide, please. So, you know, as a dementia caregiver, I know you understand the complexities and the demands of this journey. Uh, Tammy's here to support you when you need it most. So if you're struggling with burnout, stress, or guilt, Tammy can provide the assistance and expertise you need. Um, and then let's see, let me put a link to Tammy's support group in the chat. So that's one place where you can get fantastic support. And we did a drawing and Tammy Duffy is the winner of a free support group. Oh. And I will be in touch with you um, after the webinar to tell you how you can redeem that. Um, and Tammy's book, I've dropped the link into the chat a couple times. Let me do that again. Her book is Essential Strategies for the Dementia Caregiver, Learning to Pace Yourself. It's available on Amazon and on Audible. Um, and if you can stop the slide deck, please. Yeah. We do have a couple of things that came up during the um during the webinar that I'd like to have you address. Okay. Um, the first one was around the impact of dementia and folks wanted to, to hear, hear you speak about the risk of caregiver health as um, an impact of dementia. Yep. So what can often happen, and I see this a lot, is you're so absorbed in wanting to provide the best care for your loved one and your health starts getting impacted. So for example, um, I've had clients who have never, ever, ever had any heart problems, and now they're starting to have heart issues. The wear and tear of the constant demands, the challenges, the responsibilities. So we start to see health issues, um, depression. We, the stress can take a toll. They become, maybe they're not sleeping well, they're not eating well but I have had several clients, one of the precipitating factors to moving a loved one into memory care is because their health is being affected and they, have, they can no longer manage the care at home. So super important to really hone in and pay attention to how this journey is affecting you physically, mentally, and emotionally. 
And sadly, the statistics are very high on the caregivers passing away before their loved one because of the wear and tear of what happens on, on this journey, again, physically, mentally, and emotionally. So pay attention. And again, this is why engaging in that self-care and all that whole list of all these different ideas, again, allow your feelings to be a gauge as to how you're doing. If you're exhausted, we've got to get you rest. We've got to get respite care. We have to do a timeout. We bring in care. If you're having back pain and you can't sleep at night, um, these are all warning signs. Allow yourself to be tuned into what's happening to you. Allow those feelings and emotions to be a gauge as to how you're, how you're doing on this journey. So thank you for that question. And we have a couple of more. Um, Carol asks, how, do, do, how often does a person with dementia completely deny the diagnosis? And how does that affect what you shared? So that is a great question. A lot of people, so when a person gets diagnosed with dementia, a lot of times we think they're in denial when in reality they have a condition that's called anosnosa. Anosnosa is something that happens when there's damage done to the frontal temporal part of the brain, uh, which is behind the forehead, behind the ear. That is where self-awareness is stored. If there is damage in that part of the brain, there's nothing on this planet that's going to get them to see what they cannot see. It truly is a condition of the damage being done to their brain. So super important to differentiate because we get very angry. They don't see what we want them to see. It's not that they're in denial. It truly is there's damage done to that part of the brain and they can't see what they can't see. I'm visually impaired. I cannot see what I can't see. People will say to me, oh, Tammy, you see that thing? Look at, look at that pretty bird all the way out there. I can't see what I can't see. Not because I don't want to, but because I have visual impairment and impairment is damage is done to the brain. Super important because if I think they're in denial, I'm, it's going to fuel my anger versus, oh my gosh, they truly have damage done to that part of the brain is going to get me to, to step back and now reflect on it differently rather than react to it. Thank you. Um, Jerry says, fear provokes my anger even more than guilt. How much longer can I continue to keep my husband doing safe things? I can't physically stop him from walking out in the dark if he decides to. How much longer can I keep this man I've loved for 60 years with me? So that's a great question. Safety always comes first, right? And your safety and his safety. So sometimes this is often uh, one of the reasons why we'll move them into a care community because we need to keep them safe. And I don't know a lot of details, but if this was a private client, I would explore into the fear and get more details about the fear and what exactly is happening. But know that safety always comes first. And when we hear them fleeing out the door, there's a term called wandering um, and they bolt out the door then we have to put them in a safe environment. Now, one of the things we can do at home is we could put what we call fall mats, which have an alarm. So when he goes to step out of bed, you're aware he's getting out of bed. We alarm the doors. Um, we also do things to try to um, run interference. For example, we might put a big, huge stop sign on the exit doors. That sometimes stops them in their tracks and they won't leave the house or we put a black mat in front of the door and they think it's a hole so they won't step in front of it. So there are things, deterrents that we can put to prevent it. But at the same time, what I'm hearing is there's a lot of other fears that might be going on. So we'd want, I wanna get more details specifically about what those fears are so we can plan, come up with a plan on how to take the best care of him as well as the best care of you. Thank you. Um, Nancy says, my husband said if he found out he had Alzheimer's or dementia, he would end his life. I think we all feel that way. I think any of us ever thought we got dementia. A lot of people tell me that all the time, that we would end our life. So here, this is something that I hear. Um, first of all, did the person say that? The second thing is, is how would that person end their life? And we do have to take it seriously. 
well, if you got a diagnosis of dementia, then how are we going to travel this together? But I'd want to hear more details and get him to talk about why he would want to end his life, what that looks like. And is this, is this a journey we can do together? And we're in this together. So it is something it, that is expressed often because a lot of people live in fear of dementia. And we, on the receiving end of it, we see what dementia does to a person. And I know many people, none of us would want to get dementia. And, and, and it's an expression of, oh my gosh, it would be so traumatic. So I think we have to look into that and talk to him more about what that means to him. And if he was going to do it, does he have a specific plan? And if he got dementia, we'd have to talk about our relationship too. Thank you. Um, Cliff says, um, oh, I'm sorry, Nan uh, Nancy said, he does not understand that he has it. Is that denial that you just spoke of? No. Um, if he doesn't understand he has it, it's most likely because of the damage that's being done as a result of dementia in certain parts of the, the brain. Um, let's see, we have uh, Cliff asking, what are the specific challenges presented by dementia with primary progressive aphasia? Yeah, so primary progressive aphasia, um, that is something also, I think Bruce Willis, frontal temporal lobe dementia, that also can be um, something that presents differently, that has more to do with the, um, um, the, 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 the processing. Um, so you're going to want to read up on more details about the specifics about that so that you are more educated on understanding on the, on the effects that that has. Um, thank you. Linda says, uh, asks if you have recommendations or presentations for businesses to help enlighten employees to better assist shoppers with dementia, especially if they are unaccompanied. Yes, so um, I have several uh, professionals reach out to me to uh, do webinars for whatever topic or whatever the need is. So please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to put something together for your organization or your group. Fantastic. Um, I think I've caught everything from the chat um, and we're just about out of time. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, Tammy, do you have any words you'd like to end with? Uh, I just want to thank everybody. It's it's a it's a, it it can be a hard journey and a meaningful journey. And um, when it's hard, is the time to be most gentle and supportive and kind to yourself, and know that you are equally as important as the person you're taking care of. So thank you everybody for what you do. Please do re remind yourselves you truly are a gift to the people you're taking care of. And I wish you the very, very best and um, you all take care and uh, be kind to yourself. Thank you everybody for attending.